The Jedi Order's problem is Yoda. No being can wield that kind of power for centuries without becoming complacent at best, or corrupt at worst. He has no idea that it's overtaken him. He no longer sees all the little cumulative evils that the Republic tolerates and fosters. From slavery to endless wars, and he never asks, why are we not acting to stop this? Live alongside corruption for too long, and you no longer notice the stench. The Jedi cannot help the slaves of Tatooine, but they can help the slave masters. To the Chiss Ascendancy Podcast. Hey everybody, and welcome back to uh, Chiss Ascendancy. It's episode 93, thank you guys for tuning in, um, and if you watched last week's episode or listened to last week's episode, you know that we reviewed Tales of the Jedi, the Ahsoka side of things. This week, we are diving headlong into the Dooku side of things, uh, which is a real treat. A um, real treat, Governor. So speaking of treats, every week, we always say, please leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and leave a written review. We have one hey, hey, hey. Uh, this week, and I'll read it to you. Uh, so here's a five-star review, um, and the review is titled The Hillbilly and the Vulcan. Um, I wonder who this which is. <laughs> comes from whenever I used to have my mullet. Uh, okay. It says, I love these guys. The voice impressions are spectacular, which you tuned into the right episode. You did. Um, the references to other movies and books are straight out of my childhood. If you grew up in the nineties, you'll understand. Just remember the only family you have here is me. Is me. So I there finally you go. got to show Tori that scene. She's finally that seen clip. all the Star Wars movies. Yeah, I said, this is my sign-off. <laughs> Did she get it? I explained it because I wasn't sure if she got it right off the bat. But Right. Beautiful. I was very excited. So uh, we're diving into episode 93. We're going to break down um, the Dooku side of Tales of the Jedi. Now, this isn't a normal breakdown where we're going to unpack it segment by segment like we would for a ongoing show mm -hmm. um we're gonna just dive in so there are three episodes here um episode one is titled justice episode two is titled chaos and three is the sith lord respectfully episodes two three and four of tales of the jedi because of course episode one was life and death the story of ahsoka's uh, discovering her force abilities and yeah. so um let's just jump headlong right in uh so uh this first one Justice, I'll go ahead and read the uh, description here. Uh, it says, two Jedi are dispatched to resolve a hostage situation on a distant planet where tensions are running high. So, and who knew the uh, bloodbender from Avatar The Last Airbender would be making an appearance? <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're starting off hot, this one. Doesn't, oh, doesn't awesome. she look like her, though? The, you know, the stringy, long gray hair. Oh, and, yeah, dude. hundred percent. far away looking her eyes. She looks like Carrie, our next door neighbor, that was trying to teach us how to teach, uh, catch squirrels <laughs> when we lived in Kingwood. And mom was like, wow. squirrels have rabies. What a hater. Fader hater. It's if all about I die, squirrels. I die. <clears throat> Worth it. This is a short-lived life, but uh, well-lived. 
Dude, I bet you a squirrel could just bite straight through your freaking finger, bro. Maybe. I don't think so. I saw, I I saw a video today enough. where these dudes were at a bar, and the guys are obviously drunk, and this guy puts his hand on the uh, the dartboard, and he's like, you think you could do this? And of course, like in an alcohol-induced like confidence, this guy just throws this freaking dart, dude, and it goes through the guy's freaking finger. <laughs> into the board and the guy's like Fuck! and like pulls his hand away and a he didn't make it obviously right <laughs> but he just stuck to this guy's finger and he's like oh i can't remember if he was like i didn't say to try but the guy the it's just so funny this guy was drunk obviously and he's like you think you can do this so his other his friend who's also drunk is just like heck yeah and just i mean full steam throws this dart goes through freaking the guy's finger they say um, lawn darts are dangerous. I don't think it's the actual dart. I think it's just the people using it. You know what I mean? I've, I've also yeah, seen yeah, videos yeah. where people were trying to do the hand thing and it made the guy a unicorn. <laughs> I think it oh like got God. implanted into his skull. Like there were videos of people like trying to pull it out and they couldn't. And it's crazy. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. That's wild. Well, that has a lot to do with Count Dooku. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Starting in part one, okay, so you have Qui-Gon and Dooku, which is super cool because you actually had uh, Liam Neeson never come get, back to voice Duke, uh, Qui-Gon. You never get enough Qui-Gon content, IMO. There's just not enough. So I, I was selfishly very pleased to see Qui-Gon. I knew it was about Dooku, but I, right. I, had, I have a lot of Dooku content. I don't have nearly enough Qui-Gon content. Yeah, I agree. Qui-Gon tint. Um, Qui-Gon tint. Um, of course, the Ahsoka stuff was good. Um, the The first episode, Life and Death, is kind of, you know, it's it's kind of, it, it's good, but I think they could have done different things with that episode. Um, and I kind of talked about that last week. And then with Practice Makes Perfect, it's pretty much a pure setup for How Did She Survive Order 66, which is cool. And then Resolve was neat as well. Uh, kind of felt like you were just taking it straight out of uh, the Ahsoka novelization with a few tweaks here and there. Yeah, uh, which was very similar fun. to that. Um, but I would say the Dooku stuff stood out to me because there's um, there's stuff that is like it's never been seen before. So mm -hmm. the Ahsoka life and death thing was kind of was pretty original. Uh, but practice makes perfect was kind of like a setup and you're basically watching over again what happens in the future that you already saw in season seven of the clone wars mm -hmm. and then resolve if you've read or listened to the ahsoka novel there's a lot of stuff in there that you kind of know about mm -hmm. so the dooku stuff was all pretty original so um starting with justice with dooku and qui-gon kind of talk me through your thoughts what were you thinking about this this episode uh i love it it i think um dooku has been one of the most redeemed characters for me since disney bought star wars um just because i hated him i hated him so much and uh i feel that they've done a great job revisiting you know his origin story and how he became who he was because we get a lot of that um treatment for anakin right that we get to see him kind of becoming you know more and more darth vader through all these different manipulations and things going on and uh, right. then you see Dooku obviously playing both sides, even the people that he's uh, like fighting alongside for a while. He's obviously manipulating them and he's just totally full of crap. And mm -hmm. so, I, you know, you have like no respect for him. But then you see him asking these questions as a Jedi and you're like, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe he actually does believe a bit what he's saying. You know what I mean? Yeah, because, yeah, you don't you don't trust him at all in episode two and then even in the clone wars whenever like the heroes on both sides type episode where he's doing the speech mm -hmm. by then he's pretty much full corruption mm -hmm. and you're like full screw corrupt. this guy um but it's wild to see the drastic steps towards corruption mm -hmm. um that he takes in these episodes um which is speaking of corruption this episode justice um really is a very very um powerful uh episode because of how frustrated by corruption and political greed mm -hmm. dooku is um alongside his padawan qui-gon jinn so essentially they go out here to this you know backwater planet and the governor or whoever senator. whatever you want to call it senator that pretty much mm -hmm. runs the the planet um his son's been kidnapped 
And so immediately you're thrust into, okay, so what's the deal? You know, what's going on? What's the problem? Uh, and you find out pretty quickly that not as, not all is, uh, as it seems. Yeah. Dooku becomes the client very quickly. Where's the child? Where is <laughs> the child? You see the baby. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the Super Bowl last night, <laughs> so my voice is very tired today. That's funny. Yeah, me on the other end of the spectrum, uh, somebody mentioned uh, the Super Bowl at church yesterday, and I was like, that is today, isn't it? I know. I kind of felt the same way because I wasn't super involved. Um, super and involved. Just like, just like a Husbands Across America, my wife was very tuned in to the halftime show and then tuned right back out after Rihanna left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also... Um, I enjoy the uh, Alan Rickman esque take on Dooku's voice for the cartoon. Yeah, I, I I feel like it's not quite uh, not quite the movies. I mean, it's never going to be in, unless you get you know someone to come back from the dead to do the voice. Like, At this uh, point, are you uh, so obviously Sir Christopher Lee is like a freaking icon, mm -hmm. as was Sir Alec Guinness. But obviously, growing up when we grew up, uh, you and McGregor is our Obi-Wan. Mm -hmm. um, so even though the prequels came out after we were already kiddos, um, after so much Clone Wars and stuff, do you kind of feel like animation Dooku's voice is what you hear in your head? Uh, I kind of, they're separated for me. Because uh, okay. like the Dooku cartoon voice is associated with cartoon Dooku face. And then it's, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? They're just different characters to me. Um, but I was a big fan of him, you know, choking that guy out and being like, uh, corruption like yours must be eradicated. Yeah, oh, just <laughs> just kind of grabbing him. I, I, I thought that it, that it was a really cool display, though. It was very much... Um, I can never remember if this scene is Dooku Jedi Lost or if it's Master and it's Apprentice. It's Master and Apprentice. When, yeah, it's Master and Apprentice. Yeah, when they kind of get separated and... Qui Gon's chasing down this bounty hunter who's like on a personal quest uh, from the from the Blues Brothers. She's on a mission from God to get uh, one of every <laughs> age, and uh, you know she's about to nail Qui Gon, and then Dooku just goes you know full on. Oh, sorry, goes full on dark side on her. You know what I mean? Yep, I, yep. I just I like to see these uh, stories come in from the books. Did a he little bit. did he use lightning that time, or was it just he choke? Did. Oh yeah, it was lightning, wasn't it? He li he lit that chick up. Yeah, which I think that Tyrannus's uh, lightning is underrated, in my opinion. Uh, not if you're playing uh, Battlefront Two, the 2005 edition, which is all he freaking does is power <laughs> But in the grand he's scheme so of things, he's uh, the Emperor is so powerful with it, and yeah. when when Dooku uses it with Yoda, obviously Yoda is e extremely powerful and knows how to parry it, but. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's underrated. I would love to yeah. see more. I guess you you get to see it pretty cool in uh, the Clone Wars when he's training Savage Press. That was one oh, of the yeah. few times that you see Dooku's uh, Sith eyes. Oh, yeah. He he just absolutely lets loose. It kind of reminds me of um, Path of Destruction when Bane kind of figures out Force Lightning and it just makes him completely OP compared to all the other Sith apprentices. Yeah. Um, Bane, it's Bane's... Kind of kind of an out of I always heard, power. Yeah. Uh, Bane's one of those that I, I, him and Palpatine are right up there together as the greatest lightning uh, users out there. Yeah. If do you combine do, Legends material. Right. What do you think about um, this is a little bit off the beaten path, but um, do you think that do, okay. I know that Vader. I'm you trying to have a dream when you if, in, 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 <laughs> <laughs> that you that you um, Wolfie is starting to talk like that now. Uh, That's funny. Do you feel like you would rather see Vader use lightning from time to time? Or are you happy with the fact that he can't because of his suit? Like, are you cool I with think it? It's kind of. I think it's just his thing. It. Um, if you ever play the Force Unleashed. And you play as Vader and like that initial Kashyyyk mission, and you're just absolutely tearing the entire planet apart. I don't think he's really missing it any. 
<laughs> I think yeah. he's, I think he's just a okay. Um, yeah, and I think he's deadlier with his saber than he's a duelist. Uh, well. I mean, I, and I know Sidious is absolutely op with it, but um, I think Vader kind of more than makes up for it in his ability to use the Force in every other capacity because he's his suit limits him a lot. You know what I mean? He's not. Um, and I know this is Legends material now, but uh, the Darth Vader book where it's talking about him having to basically become coordinated again using the suit and how it makes him so much slower and clumsier. Is um, that Darth Vader, Dark Lord of the Sith? I think so. Yeah. That's By James, Luc James Lucino? I'd have to look. I, I think I read that book four or five years ago now, but um, but I remember that kind of being part of the discussion. So I think... Um, he kind of has to make up for it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, even, even if you look at uh, Rebels, for instance, where they come across a training holocron of Anakin going through um, like formations or whatever you want to call them. Uh, right. And they're like, oh, wow, he was really good. You know what I mean? And he was, you know, he was <laughs> a great fighter uh, and he kind of had to adjust. He's not as much of a, I mean, then we can kind of move forward into Rogue One, taking a lot of different steps here, but you see him using the the saber kind of, but he's really, right. really, really relying on the force for the most part. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's freaking sick. I mean, he, he obviously makes up for it, but I think it's just his personal, uh, his direction. You know what I mean? As, as a Sith, I think he's just kind of had to find his strength. And it's just, it's almost like the other side of Bane where Palpatine is the force lightning and Bane, the rest of him is just this berserker you know, kind of uh, all offense kind of fighting style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. Is this the one you're thinking of? Yeah, that's the one. Pretty cool that I can do that. <laughs> Pretty cool. Pretty fancy <laughs> pants. I'll, I'm, I'm enjoying all these uh, these sub searches here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's so funny. So if you're listening via audio only, uh, I'm using the, uh, the share concept here um that's showing him my other chrome tabs so we can make sure we're talking about the same book and of course like in google it has like other sub tabs and it says sith lord moment which is cool that's from the comics and then it's <laughs> the next one is darth vader badass <laughs> <laughs> and then you have darth vader pose whoo that got me okay what a enough of that. what a great amount of uh depth there <laughs> just a very who's a, a swath, I, wanna, I believe is the correct word i want to know who's out there that's like darth vader i don't know something sick show it to me <laughs> just somebody who has all the zeal but none of the knowledge that's who oh my gosh that's awesome um so we're uh we're talking about this first episode and eventually what you realize is the townspeople have taken the son of this man hostage Mm -hmm. Because um, he is essentially strip mining this planet for his mm -hmm. own gain, and I guess selling or shipping or uh, off offloading the uh, resources of this planet for his own personal profit. And so I think really they're kidnapping the kid with no intention whatsoever of hurting him. It's literally just a they attention just grabber. Want to draw awareness. Uh, yeah, they just want to grab the attention of the guy so that he will um, understand that these other people are like ev every creature, every character, humans and aliens alike are very gaunt and you can tell they're worse for wear and mm -hmm. the house or the, the town just looks like crap. <laughs> it's a real crap whole country. Yeah. Um, um, I think we get a good glimpse of what gave Dooku potential to be a really really great jedi i mean he's already a jedi master he's already you know very well accomplished um but you see him step into a situation and instead of um kind of being bullheaded like i think we would see maybe from a mace windu um right or, or maybe even a kiri mundi you see him take in the full breadth of the situation and he gets tunnel vision and you know you have Qui-Gon's awareness of the the moment kind of pulling him back out but being able to go in there and say hey we've got this person kidnapped but maybe there's more to the picture and I think that that is um, a mm -hmm. characteristic of a great Jedi 
And so, you know, asking the questions that nobody's asking, um, yeah. I think is very much Dooku's character that I think is maybe overlooked quite a bit. So I enjoy I getting think, to see that. Yeah, I think you get to see his... It's interesting because now that I'm thinking about it out loud, it's one of the first and almost one of the only times that you see him acting on his own accord. And what I mean by that is every other time you see him acting in the movies and, th- and even Clone Wars... It's like at the behest of Sidious, so he's fulfilling something for someone else. And in mm-hmm. this case, it's like he's kind of his own lead, which ends up mm-hmm. getting him in trouble in the next episode. But uh, um, I think that you see a really great balance between Dooku and Qui-Gon, where Dooku mm-hmm. is probably more powerful with the Force, but Qui-Gon has a more genuine connection to yeah. feeling the yeah. will of the Force. And I mean, we're talking about one of the most powerful Jedi of the generation versus probably the best Jedi of the generation. Right. right. You know what I mean? It, because we have this formidable wisdom in Yoda, right? He's the voice of the Jedi for centuries. But we have this other person who did what no other Jedi thought was possible. And, and it's just simply by being connected to and listening to the Force. Um, mm-hmm. and, to, and to jump ahead a little bit or to also you know, revisit Master and Apprentice, we have that um, insight into Qui-Gon that he a lot of times thought about just quitting being yeah. kind of a roadshow guy and just being the gardener. Mm-hmm. You know, he's just this really, really soft-tempered individual who um, he's like a purist. He he just loves being connected to the Force, and I think that's what made him um, the person that uh, I, I don't know if we talked about this on the show. I saw this theory that was talking about why the song Duel of the Fates is called Duel of the Fates. And mm-hmm. uh, it's not that it's um, Qui-Gon versus Maul or uh, Obi-Wan versus Maul, but it's uh, does Qui-Gon become Anakin's master or does he not? Because if Qui Gon mm-hmm. becomes Anakin's master, then he's going to be the voice that is going to guide him to being the person who Anakin was supposed to be and bringing balance mm-hmm. to the Force. Um, and, and we just have that. So it's it's really the the options of Anakin's fate that are being decided uh-huh. out of this duel. It, yeah, yeah. Wow. I thought that that was a really insightful view of it. Um, but we you know, just get to see this. I mean, he's such a pure soul. He's, he's, yeah. he's really the best of them. It's really a shame that, and I don't know if we'll get, I'm sure we'll get something uh, down the road of why this is the case, but sometime between the high Republic and roughly 200 years later, by the time this is all happening, the concept of a um, way seeker Jedi is mm-hmm. tossed and I'm not sure why. I would love to get some literature on that, maybe in one of the comics or books or something. Mm-hmm. But um, Dooku and Qui Gon both would have been fantastic mm-hmm. way seekers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if a way seeker can have a Padawan with them. Um, I'm, and by this age, Qui Gon's old enough. If he wanted to join him in that way, it would it maybe could be allowed. Um, mm-hmm. But there's a couple of Jedi, um, Orla Jereni, as well as uh, I just finished the book uh, Convergence from the High Republic Phase 2 today. Um, mm-hmm. And Gela is the Jedi in that book. And she's struggling with the concept of home and the concept of family in a galaxy that uh, seems like it doesn't have any of that for her. She, does, she f- mm-hmm. doesn't feel at home amongst the Jedi, but she honors the Jedi way. And... Uh, you know, she's, it feels like she's leaning towards that way of life. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's one of those moments where you could be weak, you could be powerful, you could be rebellious, you could be a rule follower. And if you don't just don't quite fit the mold of the Jedi, specifically underneath the way that the council has set things up, Mm -hmm. um, the Jedi trusted in the force enough back then to send you out and, and kind of trust that you would find your way back home, whether that, mm-hmm. whether you were, maybe you were a way seeker for life, but it was like, they trusted the force more where it seems like after, after a certain amount of time, maybe they started trusting in themselves more, which I guess mm-hmm. 
is kind of a good uh, transition to this second episode called Choices. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, yeah. uh, the description here is Jedi Masters Count Dooku, which he wouldn't be called Count Dooku during this time, but whatever. <laughs> I, what? Uh, uh, he might. He might have taken his title on. He didn't take the title on until he left the Jedi Council. Was that official? Okay. Yeah, he. you can't have any attachments. A title is a severe attachment. Yeah. Because you have responsibilities. I think about that, but then I also think about um, Plo Koon. What do you mean? Plo Koon, doesn't he get the uh, the hall pass? That's Kitty Mundy. Oh, sorry, Kitty and Mundy. You know what I mean? Yeah, but um, that's different because it's saving his race. For those who don't know what we're talking about... <laughs> It's either I guess it's Kiati Mundi. I always say Kai. Uh Kiati Mundi is a uh, Syrian, I want to say. Is that the uh That is correct. Um he's a Syrian Jedi and his species uh it's either hard for them to mate or there's a very small amount of them in the world or something. Anyways, long story short in legends, I don't think it's canon anymore. Uh Kiati Mundi was allowed to have like six wives or something like that so that he could Real Avros finish. was all about it doesn't mean you can't get laid yeah um i don't think uh, he can be a count because in kitty mundy's uh circumstances it was not an attachment thing it was literally like a dude that's why kitty mundy was so relaxed <laughs> he's like what about the drug the... attack on the wookies <laughs> he's like smoking a something? blunt sitting in a love sack <laughs> what about the joint attack on the wookies and they're like Kenny Mundy, why are you asleep? And he's like, you know why I'm asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why he was like, I think Master Obi-Wan should go. He's like, I've got things to do. I've got a three o'clock and a 4.30. <laughs> I've got a tooth hurty, but it's not a dentist appointment, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh. He's got a freaking... Uh... Isn't there a song called Rock Around the Clock? <laughs> Maybe. Oh, I'm not going to rule it out. Um, anyway, yeah, that's that's a fair point. Anyway. Oh, my God. Fin finish your reading, please. Um, but it says uh, Jedi Masters Count Dooku and Mace Windu work together, which is arguable, to investigate the mysterious death of <laughs> one of their own. Um, so it's really interesting to me because... In this case, you're looking at uh, Jedi Masters Dooku and Windu going to investigate the death of a Jedi, and there's a, there's a bunch of nonsense going on where uh, not it is not what it appears to be, and yeah. so they get there, and it's kind of like a weird thing where this other Jedi was sent there to investigate something that didn't seem so serious, mm -hmm. um, and then her death. Uh, brings about their investigation and you rewatched this today. So break it, it down is. a little bit, what we see for us, uh, what we see happening here. Cause um, I remember the gist, but I would like to get some details in there. I, uh, well, I think a good <sighs> stepping stone would be from our last point of conversation. And that is um, Dooku kind of being the one who's, wanting to do maybe not the correct thing but the right thing if that makes sense he he was trying to do the morally or the i don't know just doing something that's right without doing it necessarily by the book um no i think that makes and, a lot of sense actually and and i think it's very 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 apparent when he's partnered with mace windu because he says you're devotion to rules is sometimes inspiring and sometimes maddening uh yeah <laughs> I, I think that that is very uh very quintessential of what we're looking at here in, in this particular episode where just the whole time mace windu's like we should we should tell the council and uh <laughs> and and count dooku is like i i think that i'm going to do it my way uh, just to, just to bounce it off the walls there. And, uh, it, that's the whole episode really, uh, literally everything. I, I think, it, I think that that it's the idea of the Jedi. I think that's where they kind of go badly because Mace Windu saying, you know, we 
uh, are not members of the Jedi Council and we haven't been right. instructed by the Jedi Council or the Senate. And that right there, like that one sentence he says by the Jedi Council or the Senate, or in the previous episode, the senator saying, hey, you serve the Senate. And Dooku says, no, we serve the people of this republic. And I think it's the, you know, this idea <laughs> is very, they're very, very, very far apart on on who they really answer to or what their purpose is. Right. Um, and even though Dooku is going like balls to the walls against all these uh, different guards trying to get the proper answers, uh, he even ends up agreeing with uh, the person who's the only the only guard left um, that was a member of the assassination, and I th I think that um, that open mindedness is Dooku's perhaps greatest strength and greatest fault. Um, but I, I I love this episode. Also, it's like watching the All Star Game. You have the two most formidable fighters in the whole Jedi Order. You know, just going right. ham on on like seven people. Uh, so you know, you see Dooku cutting freaking trees in half and using them he's weaponizing trees man like who's doing that right uh, so yeah <laughs> I, I think it's just cool uh to see that aspect of it but then it's very 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 um and it's cool i think that it looks to dooku like mace windu betrayed him a little bit uh oh absolutely when he joined the council and uh i don't know there's just a lot 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 going on there it seems like maybe they have a, a bit of an ongoing friendship or a bit of a history there and uh the moment that uh when it Duke definitely feels on, like the council yeah. departed like their, <clears throat> their their relationship's over it kind of feels like whenever dooku learns that mace joins the council it's kind of like um you're no longer uh you're no longer trustworthy like i can't mm -hmm. confide in you like i could before because now you're a part of the association and i was really frustrated right. by you right. know by that situation you you were supposed to and also it was frustrating for him i'm sure because dooku equally deserved that place yeah um, and probably brought more results than mace did but mace was was a company man in a sense he, you he know was the he was the soft option and i, I think yeah. um i think also dooku was frustrated because every single time he was trying to get answers Windu's like, we should refer to the council. We should, we should, we should, we should. You know what I mean? And Dooku's like, hey, if you had been killed, wouldn't you want us to like go the extra mile? And oh, Windu 100%. says, I would like you to, you know, follow protocol. And uh, Dooku's just like, all right, whatever, man. Which <laughs> I don't still... believe at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. You totally I, I would know. want them to do the right thing. You would totally yeah. want them to, you know. It's just it's such just... a cop out. And I think that Dooku is like even more frustrated because he had all these hangups with Windu with everything that right. went on. And he's like, oh, OK, so you were just doing this to to get where you were going. You know, I, th I think he was just really exasperated. I think like that was the straw that broke the camel's back in that relationship. A hundred percent. So, yeah, I think that I think that that was a very good I mean, it was a very telling episode about Mace Windu as much as it was about Dooku. Um, and when yeah, I think so too. And the, and the way that it's revealing about Windu, I think it's revealing about the state of the Jedi overall, um, especially in light of the material that we get from the High Republic. <clears throat> yeah, I think so too. And I was actually going to uh, let's see if I can find this. I was actually going to. I read this. This will be um, something that was really interesting. This is actually from uh, the Clone Wars novel, uh, which came out a while ago. Uh, this one's written by Karen Travis which is one of the greatest Star Wars authors of all time. Um, but <clears throat> this is at the beginning of uh, the ninth chapter of that book. And it says, and I, I won't do the, uh, the impression was at the beginning of this episode, so I won't do it again. Um, <laughs> for those of you listening, that wasn't uh, Corey Burton from the Clone Wars. That was me. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, but it says ultimately. For those of you who are just listening, also, Josiah is physically patting himself on the back right now. Just, <laughs> you know, full. Two hands. Um, it says the Jedi Order's problem is Yoda. No being can wield that kind of power for centuries without becoming complacent at best or corrupt at worst. He has no idea it's overtaken him. He no longer sees all the little uh, cumulative evils that the Republic 
tolerates and fosters from slavery to endless wars. And he never asks, why are we not acting to stop this? Live alongside cor uh, corruption for too long and you no longer notice the stench. And then this is like very, uh, a very strong accusation here. It says the Jedi cannot help the slaves of Tatooine, but they can help the slave masters. And that's mm -hmm. Dooku, Jedi, uh, former Padawan of Yoda to Darth Sidious. Um, so Dooku's obviously given him the, uh, the inside scoop, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to all that, but it's just wild that, um, <clears throat> You've got Dooku, this character who he sees the corruption, he hates the corruption, mm -hmm. and his ultimate win is to uh, to try to do the right thing and just make things happen. And then he gets penalized for breaking the rules. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's I'm sure it's very frustrating because it's like, dude, the idea is not like yes, we follow the rules when it's applicable and me by nature, I'm a rule follower, but at the same time, what he's saying is ultimately, are we going to find the answers? Like this person deserves respect. This person, this, this fallen Jedi deserves answers. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, in this episode, I feel like they don't get the answers. If Dooku doesn't go a little bit outside of the box of normal oh, yeah. thinking. Yeah, and, and Windu's like, hey, they're lying. We should bring this information back to the council. And <laughs> what the frick are they going to do? You know what I mean? Like, you are you are the investigation. And I, I think um, Dooku's very much boots on the ground. And I think that characteristic also helped shape Qui-Gon into being who he is. Um, yeah, he's absolutely. the person who is going to do probably the morally right thing or the responsibly right thing as opposed to the right thing according to procedure. So, and I think yeah, also I think you kind of great again, <clears throat> if we did it and I don't know when this is going to take place, but if we don't get rid of the way seeker, you have characters like Dooku who probably won't have that same level of frustration that you see in him because he's getting to go out there and explore um, the, the deeper waters of the force, you know, he's getting mm -hmm. to be, to, to trust in the force and see what it has for him. Whereas now the frustrations are high because he's, he feels like he's on this leash and it's, uh, it's interesting because you have the Senator from the first episode that says you work for the Senate and Duke whose response is, no, we don't, we work for the citizens of the Republic essentially. Mm -hmm. And, but then when it boils down to it, most of the way through the second episode, he's trying to serve the people and serve the Jedi and mm -hmm. Mace serves the council who serves the Senate. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, I don't know. It's really interesting, uh, but moving forward a little bit to uh, part three, the Sith Lord. Um, oh, this one hurts the most. It's so it sad, dude. Most. It's so sad because, um, you start to see, uh, <clears throat> I did a, a short recently for the channel talking about the similarities between Ben Solo, a.k.a. Kylo Ren, and Jason Solo, a.k.a. Darth Kytus. And uh, Jason Solo, for those of you who don't know his story, long story short, uh, amazing fighter, very theological in his approach to the Force, like uh, a thinker before a fighter. Uh, a lot of Qui-Gon and Jason. But... At some point, he has a force vision where there's a dark man sitting on the throne uh, ruling the galaxy and standing next to the dark man and his, is his daughter serving alongside him. So he has the double urgency because as a father, he doesn't want his daughter to serve the dark side. And he also sees this dark kind of shrouded figure ruling the galaxy after uh, it cost his grandfather everything. And it's costing his, you know, the death of his brother Anakin and Chewbacca and some of these others in Legends that died. Um, trying to save the galaxy and he gets to a place where he doesn't feel like the Jedi and the new Republic uh, are, or the Galactic Alliance at this point are going to save themselves. And the only way that he can become powerful enough to save the galaxy is to kind of dip into the dark side. And of course that current is, uh, is much stronger than you realize. And it's really sad because again, the fleshing out of Dooku's character you start to see that, especially in this episode of he really is trying to do the right thing, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's he's starting to bite off more than he can chew. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we move into the third episode, we see kind of um, I thought it was interesting. Also, a little little thing that uh, you see Dooku in that little speeder. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's the same mm -hmm. speeder that Anakin takes to meet up with Sidious, basically, when he becomes Darth Vader. So I right. thought that that little uh, connection point was interesting. It's obviously not a substance, but just a little tidbit. Um, but I think you start to see the resentment with the Jedi um, really yeah, taking 100%. root. That he was um, questioning and he was frustrated, but now he's resentful. And I think that's really the shift in his character. Also, as we see um, Sidious completely disregard the rule of two once again. Uh, <laughs> just doing <laughs> yeah, whatever it takes. Yeah, unpack uh, for that, us for a little bit. Uh, well, y you see Dooku obviously already working with slash for Palpatine, uh, right. erasing Kamino from the archives, and that was before Which, so sick. I loved getting to see that. That was cool. Also, I was like surprisingly easy uh, because I work in like a really heavy, heavily uh, regulated industry, so I'm like everything has to get triple checked, and this guy's just able to walk into the library and delete stuff. Uh, but you know, enough of that. Yeah. He's like, don't um, mind if I do. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I'll sign it and I'll approve it. I'll notarize my own signature and nobody's going to be the wiser. Um, but you just kind of see him waltz in, waltz out. Uh, so already under the, you know, the leadership or tutelage or direction of Palpatine and, uh, then Palpatine's going to say, I lost an apprentice and you lost an apprentice also. Hey, apprentice. Uh, so, you know, both, both Maul and um, Dooku are serving Palpatine at this point. So it's very interesting to see Sidious completely, um, completely disregarding the rule of two that only one master, only one apprentice. And I think that that's probably part of um, Palpatine thinking that he's the culmination of the rule of two. So he's the exception to the rule of two. Um, just to personal yeah, it's, been on it's been fulfilled in a sense. Yeah. He's like, I am it. I've made because it. Because what's interesting is, and obviously we need a little bit more in canon for this, but in legends, Sidious served Plagueis all up until the point that he was made the chancellor of the Republic, which is far. Yes, I need this. I need this in, in canon. Yeah, we need to figure this out because if he does honor the rule of two, um, his in episode one, pretty early on, Newt Gunray and all the other Nymodians can't find the Jedi, and uh, he says it's impossible to find them down here. And uh, Sidious says, not for a Sith, in comes Darth Maul, who's apparently a Sith. And this is pretty, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is prior to the point where he becomes the Chancellor. And in Legends, he kills he kills uh, Plagueis when he becomes the Chancellor. Uh, and then he's already touching Dooku's butt backstage, trying to get him <laughs> to lead the Jedi Order. So at some point, in a sense, he's recruiting Dooku if he's not already pretty much got his claws in him at this point, and he's serving Plagueis, and he has Maul. Like, yeah. for, for a split second there, there's four of them, if you think about it. Yeah, I doubt the timeline's going to be quite as similar as we see it in Plagueis. Um, also, a good old books by Max. Uh, just run, really running up the numbers today. Um but yeah, no, complete complete disregard for the rule of two there by Palpatine. And uh, yeah, this is a very interesting episode. I think we get to see the best of Dooku in episodes one and two. I think we get to see um, the turn of Dooku very, very prominently in episode three of this arc. Um, right. But it's also, I don't know, it's still very sentimental because he's wanting to meet Obi-Wan. He's still buddy buddy with Qui-Gon genuinely worried for his safety genuinely upset at his passing um, yeah. not in the way that we see him upset or concerned in the Clone Wars where it's always just a farce it's always just a ruse um, yeah it's it's uh, <clears throat> it's really really it brings a ton more weight to that scene in Attack of the Clones where mm -hmm. he's taken Obi-Wan captive 
and he's yeah. like, I could really use Qui-Gon's help right now. Right. Because it's interesting. I always thought, you know, and let me get your thoughts on this. I always thought that that line to Obi-Wan was just like just him trying to him. just trying to trigger his emotions and manipulate him. Yeah. But after seeing this series, again, it's just so enriching for the story. I really feel like uh, he meant it, dude. I really feel like. Yeah. Well, and we yes, can see. And no. We can see in the big picture, Dooku's still full of crap, but he's also the, I don't know, he's the he's the the master of the half truth, right? That there's a little see, there's a little something something in there for realsies. Um, he's the dog poop in the tray of brownies your youth pastor made. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he is. I mean, because he's there. He's I, even when you see him. Uh, let's talk about the Clone Wars film, mm-hmm. and uh, we see him kind of interacting with uh Jabba and talking about how the Jedi have uh you know taken the hutling and they're gonna kill him, et cetera, et cetera. He did really have the footage of Anakin saying, I hate huts. You know what I mean? And right. and seeing them. So there he always has some grain of truth that makes his life so much more believable. So I mean I believe that he still has the emotional connection to Qui-Gon. And and right. that was kind of my my big overarching point is that Maybe that one particular scene where he's interacting with Obi-Wan directly for the first time isn't as much of a manipulation as we thought. Like there, maybe there is a little bit of vulnerability there for real. Yeah, Um, I think so too. And it's interesting. I I think he really missed Qui-Gon and I think he genuinely thought maybe Qui-Gon would be on his side. I think he actually thinks that because he's a bit deluded at this point. Um, And I think, well, ultimately too, I wonder if, you know, how quick was Anakin to be like, I I can overthrow Palpatine. I can, yeah. <laughs> we can, you know, it's ultimately we can Anakin. Rule this, we can rule together, Padme. Yeah. Ultimately, he doesn't really care about Palpatine as much as he cares about the means to the end. Yeah. And there's a part of me that feels like Dooku kind of feels the same way. You know what yeah. I mean? I could see that. Well, and it's, uh, it's kind of hard to be attached to Palps. I think, it's very te- – it's funny. I just uh, – I was giving you crap about patting yourself on the back. I'm literally wearing a T-shirt with my own face on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think the way that Palpatine talks to Dooku is very telling in Dooku's motives because um, when Palpatine talks to Anakin, he's saying this is all about Padme. We can – you know, all, all of the end was saving Padme, learning the Force technique to, to save Padme. Yeah. And when he's talking to the simple Dooku, man, yeah, <laughs> he knows which head he's thinking with. And uh, <laughs> then we have Dooku, who is obviously a much, he's a silver fox. So he's got right. uh, some, some years under his belt. And he's saying, I lost an apprentice. You lost an apprentice. And I'm going to ask so much more of you if we're to succeed in this greater good. Like they're not, he's not calling Dooku to serve him. Basically, he's calling Dooku to serve this greater purpose. Yeah, we're working I together think that for the betterment of the galaxy. Yeah, I think that's very telling of um, of Dooku's motivations at this point. So I think his motives maybe were a bit more altruistic. And, you know, um, I'm sure he wasn't the uh, Scrooge McDuck that we see in the Bad Batch when they're trying to <laughs> trying to <laughs> raid his coffers there. Um, you know, he's taking, uh, <laughs> taking a little coin bath, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think that very much like, I mean, Palpatine's a master, master, master manipulator. So, no, oh, 100%. Um, and he, he, kind of he, um, he, tr- he kind of plays on, he kind of plays on Dooku's narcissism by saying, hey, we can fix this together. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Dooku's like, I am a solution, you know, like a good heart, but a li- uh, but clearly thinks highly of himself, mm-hmm. you know? Well, I mean, I, 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 He's the Sherlock Holmes, you know, to, he rates, he doesn't rate humility amongst one of the virtues, you know, uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, I think that's, that really that's very interesting. I think also like, um, the, you know, the little subheader here says Count Dooku must contemplate his next move when he discovers something troubling that leads him to double, uh, doubting the Je- Jedi order. Um, it's interesting because I can't remember. Now you watched this today at in this episode. Has he already left? 
has the who order? already left? Has Duke already uh, left the order in this episode? Not officially. Not officially, because he had just left the temple. He gets tailed by Yaddle. Um, okay, you're right. You're he's right, still you're right. meeting up in the industrial sector in secret. Um, and I think he's probably about to formally leave the order because this is the moment where he um, refused to go to Qui-Gon's funeral because he's pissed at the council. Um, mm. And I, I think that this episode's also telling not just of Dooku, but of some of the more eyes open Jedi a la Yaddle, um, where she's saying she had stepped down from her seat in the council. Yeah. Uh, she agrees she, she, with she, the questions that Dooku's asking. Yeah. Cause and so, it's, and what's interesting about this, that kind of, sorry for interrupting, but mm -hmm. I didn't want to lose this thought, but what's really interesting is going back from that quote where Dooku is telling Sidious, listen, the problem with the Jedi is Yoda. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because not long after this, if this hasn't already, it's probably, it hasn't happened yet, but not long after this, um, cause the first real sacrifice for Dooku is Yaddle, um, here at the end oh, of this episode. I, if, you, if you don't count Qui-Gon, but yeah, well, cause he, he knew who Maul was, you know what I mean? So he was saying he was worried he couldn't protect Qui-Gon from Maul. And yeah. could have maybe, you know, given him a little nudge in the, Hey, don't go there direction. Um, right. But I guess what I'm saying is there's also a chance that Qui-Gon beats Maul or the two of them can beat Maul. I don't think that Dooku thinks that that's there. If Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon weren't separated, I don't see a world where Maul can, can kill one of them. Yeah. But so what I I'm saying think... is there's, there's a snowball's chance in hell that it doesn't happen. Whereas he literally chooses to kill Yaddle after he thought he killed her once already with the door. <laughs> Let me give you peace. Let me give you peace. Um, but that was pretty baller though. What's interesting to me is like, he's not wrong. Like the council is blind and mm -hmm. they're blind to the things that he's bringing up. They're blind to the way, like he has questions about their involvement with the Senate and their, you know, the political term that you would see if you turned on CNN or MSNBC or Fox news is the term in bed where it's like, why are you guys so connected? Like, mm -hmm. shouldn't you be completely separate and they call on you because they're the governing body when they need help? It's not, yeah. you're not at their beck and call, you know? Um, and ultimately them being generals in the Clone Wars is a pretty red flag. Um, but him having questions and being thrown to the side and Dooku, I mean, uh, and Mace Windu getting the nod because he he's not a free thinker. And somewhere along the line, the dismissal of the term way seeker and the role of the way seeker and then yaddle sees it too and not long after this they completely disregard um sifo-dyas's vision mm -hmm. you know and yeah. and the idea that visions are powerful or real or whatever it's it's one of those things where it's like uh they are they're kind of a uh xenophobe uh in the sense of if the council is not familiar with it, then we really don't want to work with that. Yeah. I you think know? it's if also... If Mace Windu had the gift of force visions, when Sifo on the council said something, Mace would have said, I concur. And they would have worked on it. But because it wasn't familiar, Sifo got pushed out, which ultimately yeah. led to Order 66. And I think it um, it's also very apparent in... Yaddle's start at that episode at the beginning of the episode where she says speaking for the council um we should wait for more information before taking action that it's uh we recognize that one of our greatest jedi just went toe to toe with the sith but we're not totally sure you know what i mean it's like right. this overabundance of caution mm -hmm. um and i think it's also born out of hubris that um that they can deal with it no matter what so there's not really a a need to rush to action right now until we really, really know what's going on. But then once yeah. we do, it'll totally be fine. You know it kind I mean? of reminds me of that line from, you know, love it or hate it. There's a lot of really good concepts and dialogue in the last Jedi. And there's that quote from Luke about the Jedi. The Jedi are romanticized, deified. But if you strip away the myth and look at their deeds, the legacy of the Jedi is failure. 
hypocrisy, hubris. That's not true. At the height of their powers, they allowed Darth Sidious to rise, create the Empire, and wipe them out. It was a Jedi Master who was responsible for the training and creation of Darth Vader. Mm -hmm. And there's that quote, you know, at the height of their power, look what happened. And mm -hmm. I think that Dooku really sees that. And I think what a tragedy that Dooku felt that he had to go the way that he went. And then eventually his pride caught up with him, you know, mm -hmm. being obviously coming from a faith background, like getting out from under the will of God, letting your pride, you know, pride comes before a fall type of thing. Um, but in, in a, in a very real sense here, like feeling like he had to align himself with the Sith to bring order and justice to the galaxy and mm -hmm. eventually it corrupts him, you know. And what's crazy is I'm sure in the middle of the Clone Wars, if you would have asked Dooku, have you been corrupted? He would be like, no, we're doing it for the greater good. But then by the time you get to the Bad Batch and you see how his homeworld is like kind of in shambles, which obviously was done afterward by the Empire, but ramifications of his actions. Right. His people are starving. And it's like, like you said, a Scrooge McDuck's worth of coins yeah. uh in his place so it's just it's a really sad but I, I think these three episodes to me um the ahsoka stuff was awesome and i would love uh, we said this last week i mean i would just i would dive head first into a season two of tales of the jedi or uh mm -hmm. tales of the sith would be amazing too but um these three episodes seem to be more sequential and and build uh more greatly on one another towards a culmination there I, I feel personally that it adds more to Star Wars. I think it I think it yeah. tells more Yeah, about, totally. It's there's a lot of information about Ahsoka. Very, very cool. But this is um this is the Star Wars story. You know what I mean? Like this is This is uh, the story that really shows it's a galaxy wide impacting fall from mm -hmm. grace for one of the greatest of the era because of the hubris of the masters. Yeah, I think these three these three episodes are like the answers to all the riddles that make uh, episode two really hard to watch for the first time uh, yes. because it's so political and so dense. And I, I think that this is the the answer to all those questions. And I, th yeah, I just think I feel like these three episodes are very, very dense, very important to the Star Wars story overall. I 100% agree. Um. So let me ask you this, um, you know, what, what do you think would happen? And, and we'll wind down here in the next, you know, five minutes or so. Um, what do you think would be different if Dooku had, had gotten the recognition that we probably agree he deserved after that mission with Mace Windu? And if Dooku gets the nod, if Dooku gets the nod, how much less reluctant is Qui-Gon to be on the council. And if Qui-Gon's there and Dooku's there, when Sifo has the vision, at least those two entertain the idea that it's real because of Dooku's connection to Sifo and Qui-Gon's belief in the cosmic force. Neither one of them are afraid of those kind of more niche and kind of weird parts of the force like force visions. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how drastically different is the galaxy? I see Dooku doing what Qui-Gon would do and not taking a seat on the council because he disagrees with them so heartily. Um, I think that he probably sees himself as more effective. Um, you think so? He was so butthurt about Mace it. getting the seat, though. I think he was butthurt that Mace took it. I don't think he was butthurt Upset that at Mace, Mace not at the Jedi. Mm-hmm. As I think he expects that that's what the council would have done. I I think he was frustrated that Mace went along with it. At least that's how I see it. I can see what you're saying. Humor me. How different is the galaxy if Dooku and Qui-Gon do take those places, though? Uh, well, I mean, specifically in regards to the vision that Sifo Dyas has, because so much of Dooku is it and Master Sifo were homies. Is it is it Dooku Jedi lost? that Sifo is in it heavily, right? Yes. And it's, and it's it in Master and Apprentice that they talk so much about the prophecies. Mm -hmm. I mean, just imagine a world where, is it Coleman Trevor? I guess it's, a, the world's different in this case, but when Coleman, uh, 
Trevor dies, that Obi-Wan takes his seat on the council in Brotherhood. Um, I think that's the case. You never read Brotherhood, huh? Mm-mm. Um, anyways, I wonder what life would have been like if the four of those guys, I mean, it's kind of a, a close circle, but <laughs> Yoda, Dooku, Qui-Gon, but, Obi-Wan. And sifo Yeah. Because Sifo was well, on the council and was the, dismissed. I'm just saying that's the... the yeah, Yoda the Grandpa line. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it makes sense, but how many, uh, how many, let's, I'm going to look this up. How many council seats are there? 12. Is it a set number? Because nobody steps down when Anakin gets a seat. That I'm aware 12, of. 12 members. Is it? Okay. Anakin doesn't, Anakin, you know, he doesn't get the seat at rank of master. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, Yaddle maybe Wars probably never would have happened. Maybe Yaddle, uh, but Yaddle probably. Oh, they would've... they just added an extra seat because he was a uh, representative for for the the chancellor. chancellor. I mean, according to Google, it says Anakin Skywalker never replaced anyone in the Jedi Hound Council. He was temporary part of the council as Supreme Chancellor's representative. Yeah, that checks out. Also, Obi-Wan wouldn't have taken Yaddle's seat. That would have been way too big a gap. No, Obi-Wan took Coleman, Coleman Trevor's. Oh, you just said Yaddle, maybe. So I was like, eh. I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I don't think the Clone Wars would have happened. Um, yeah. I think I Palpatine either. would have had a much more difficult time rising to power, but I mean, that's, uh, that's Palpatine for you, right? Pull right. all the right strings. I mean, he knew it. He knew exactly what it needed to happen. He was already, you know, clouding the vision of the Jedi. So I think that he probably very much had something to do with that. Mm. Yeah, it's hard to say. I I know you love speculation. I'm always the who's to say guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, let's see. Yeah, Coleman Trevor is the one that Obi Wan replaced. Which, if you don't know who that is, that's the cool dinosaur looking dude that Jango totally pones in doom, episode doom, two. Doom, doom, doom. Whose uh, specialty was deflection, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um well we'll go ahead and wind this down uh it's been really fun but man we could talk about count dooku and uh that string of uh episodes for forever there's so much to unpack but um thank you guys so much for tuning in uh if you haven't already we talked about this at the beginning of this episode but uh leave us a five-star rating on apple uh podcast and ri- write us a written review and we will read it on air and uh, feel free to follow us on all of that social media stuff that you see. And thank you once again for tuning in. The Force will be with you always. And remember, the only family you have here is me. Thanks once again, guys. We'll see you next time. <laughs>